Awesome. Well, welcome everyone. It's, uh, it's definitely an honor and a blessing to be able to share this morning and to share what I think God has put on my heart. Uh, I know he's put on my heart, uh, for everyone in this group. Um, just a little bit about who I am real quick before we get going, but, uh, I live in Fort St. John in BC, which is about 13, 14 hours North of Vancouver. Uh, I just moved here this past March and, um, yeah, I have a wife and I have a little daughter. She's nine months and, uh, yeah, it's, it's been, uh, definitely a crazy, crazy ride getting up here. Um, but it's been a lot of fun. So part of my job is I work at a church up here at Fort St. John Alliance, and um, I help out, part of my role is to help out with the youth ministry. So this past Friday, we were uh, at a park in town, we were playing capture the flag, and, uh, you know, there's some bush, there's some trees, but, you know, you don't really expect too much of it. I remember some kids saying, uh, oh, I think there's stinging nettle in there, like my legs feel a little, little hot. And I was like, um, I don't think there would be stinging nettle in a city park, but, you know, it's probably fine. And so I decided in that moment to make a charge into the bush to go try and find this flag, help her team out. And uh, there was stinging nettle. There was actually a lot of stinging nettle in that bush. Uh, and I kept going back in, which was a bad idea. But my legs at the end of it were red hot. They were bleeding. They were scabbed. Um, and I remembered pretty quickly what stinging nettle felt like. And uh, I remembered why you don't touch it multiple times and why you should stay away from it. But we all have moments like this where our memory uh, plays a really important part in our life. Um, memories, you know, just remembering things in general help us to make decisions. They help us to look forward to the future. They tell us what not to do and what to do. And sometimes when we don't remember things as well as we probably should, it can lead us down some um, pretty into some pretty bad positions, like, you know, your legs being on fire because you ran in a bush of stinging nettle. Um, and I really believe that this psalm today calls us to remember and that a lot of what David is doing here is remembering what God was like. So uh, I'm going to read Psalm 63 here, verses 1 to 11. That's the entirety of the psalm. Uh, and it says this, a psalm of David when he was in the desert of Judah. You, God, are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water. I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your glory and your power. Because your, life, because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live, and in your name I will lift up my hands. I will be fully satisfied as with the richest of foods. With singing lips, my mouth will praise you. On my bed, I remember you. I think of you through the watches of the night. Because you are my help, I sing in the shadow of, the, of your wings. I cling to you. Your right hand upholds me. Those who want to kill me will be destroyed. They will go down to the depths of the earth. They will be given over to the sword and become food for jackals. But the king will rejoice in God. All who swear by God will glory in him, while the mouths of liars will be silenced. So I just want to give a little bit of context for this passage before I kind of, you know, explain what I think this passage means. But, you know, David is in the wilderness of Judah. He's at, and you know, people think that he's either running from King Saul, he wants to kill him, or it could be when he was running from his son, Absalom, who also wanted to kill him. Uh, either way, not a great situation that David is facing. But yet, this is the psalm that's recorded. This is what he wrote in this moment. And so I kind of have three main points, or th there's three different sections to um, this passage. And the first is remembering God's presence leads to trust in God. This is verses one to five. And so we see first off David, just seeking after God earnestly. I seek you. I thirst for you. 
My whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water. And that image is just so great because I'm sure every guy in here has experienced moments where you feel super dehydrated and need something to drink. And this is what David is saying. His thirst for God is like, it's like he has no water and he needs water desperately. And that's what God is to him. God is the thing that sustains him and provides for him, gives him nourishment. And then in verse two, we see this idea of remembrance. I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and glory. In Old Testament times, God's presence was in the tabernacle. It was in the sanctuary. And so that is where you would go. You would go to the tabernacle, give your offerings, and then you experience God's presence, the fullness of who he is in that sanctuary. But remember, David's in the wilderness. He's nowhere near. He's running for his life, and yet he can still remember God's power and glory in the midst of that. And what is his response? Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live. And it's pretty interesting. We see, we see David remember this experience. We see him remember this moment of God's power and glory. And that leads to trust, that leads to worship and who God is. And we see in verse five, I will be fully satisfied as with the richest of foods. With singing lips, my mouth will praise you. It's interesting, some different Bible translations say, you know, I will be fully satisfied or I thirst for you or uh, I cling to you. Instead of it being the word I, it's my soul. And it's not to think of some disembodied experience, but it's to think about the fact, uh, you know, back in that time, the soul was, you know, the innermost part of who a person was, right? We kind of refer to it as our heart nowadays, but, and that would be a similar kind of idea, but our, our heart's needs, right? My heart, my soul will be fully satisfied. My heart, my soul thirst for you. My heart and my soul cling to you. Our innermost desires and our needs need to be God. He needs to be the thing that sustains us, the thing that gives us nourishment. And verses six and eight, remembering God's faithful love will sustain us and lead to worship. This is, this is probably my favorite part of the passage. I'm just going to play my, play my hands right there, but, um, on my bed, I remember you. I think of you through the watches of the night. The reason why I think why I love this so much is it doesn't say, you know, David is sitting around a campfire, making s'mores, you know, having a good summer night. No, it's on my bed, I remember you. I think of you through the watches of the night, meaning he's trying to sleep, but he's waking up in fear of his life, fear that someone will come and kill him or capture him. And what does David do in the midst of that, in the midst of his anxiety, in the midst of his worry? On my bed, I remember you. In the ESV, it says, I meditate on you. It means that David is, um, it means that David is, is meditating on God's worth, his truth, the way that God has been for them, been, been for him in the past. He's remembering God's promises and trusting that ultimately God will provide for him. That even though he may hear a sound in the bush that might be someone to kill someone coming to kill him, he's choosing to remember God's promises, choosing to remember who God is. Because you are my help, I sing in the shadow of your wings. I cling to you. Your right hand upholds me. We just see this, this dependence on God. God being his protector, that he can worship him in God's protect, that he can worship God while he's protected by God. And that God's right hand is upholding him, giving him honor and sustaining him in the midst of trials and suffering. And it's really interesting. God is still present and caring for you, even if you can't feel him. And then verses 9 and 11 in the way that it kind of ends, confidence in God's provision. You know, it's a, maybe a little bit violent, the passage, but the idea 
is that uh, it shows God's complete victory over the enemy of, enemies of God's. It's complete victory for David. God will completely rescue and completely save him. And notice that David is worshiping God, even though this hasn't happened yet. He hasn't reached the end point yet. He isn't saved yet. He's still lying on a mat. No, well, probably not even on a mat. He's lying on the ground in the Judean wilderness by himself. And yet he's still choosing to praise and worship God. And so I guess my kind of overall point from this is that even when we feel distant from God and his presence, we are to remember his faithful love, his presence, his power, his might, and we are to worship him in confidence of what he can do. You know, I think about my own life um, and my own story. You know, I, I grew up in a divorced home. Um, my parents divorced when I was two or three and, um, my family was just really broken. It was really messy and I didn't grow up in a Christian home. Um, and so my way of medicating myself was through pornography was through the PMO cycle. And you know, it, it, it didn't work. It didn't make my problems go away. It didn't make the hurt go away. Um, it barely, it didn't even get me through the day, honestly. Like I felt like crap every time. And, uh, you know, I remember going to youth group and just, uh, you know, over time recognizing that my addiction was, you know, just doing what God was supposed to be doing, right? Like, I was substituting God's love and his faithfulness and his, the fact that he sustains me. And instead I was choosing to self-medicate, to look at pornography, to, to, to do those things because I felt empty and hollow inside. And um, I think over time, I just started to realize that it, it's not, well, and I think a lot of us here can relate, but that stuff just doesn't, in the long run, it doesn't actually help us. Uh, it doesn't actually lead us into a deeper life, into a better life. Um, and actually it can, instead of, you know, helping us overcome our problems, it creates more problems. Um, and so I just remember, uh, you know, a leader of mine in my own life, a mentor in my own life, telling me that I needed to really be done with this be done with my addiction um, because it, it was actually, I was worshiping that instead of God. And I was trusting in that instead of God. And I recognized that it was a sinful pattern in my own life. And so what's, what's our response? You know, what do we, what do we do with this? Well, and I didn't put this in here, so you may want to make a note, but you know, the, there's a, there's an important difference in the new Testament, right? God has given us his spirit to indwell in us, to be in us. And, and God's presence now lives in us and resides in us. And so unlike David, when we feel distant from God, the reality is, is that his love and his presence is in us because his spirit dwells in us. If we choose to follow Jesus. So I just want to make that distinction before I went into a response, but, um, uh, I, first off, emotions and feelings are really important. Yeah, I can't understate that. They are important, but they cannot dictate how we view reality. God's truth and his promises need to guide our lives and our recovery. And, and what I mean by that is when we feel sad or upset or mad at something, it's important to process those emotions, but they can't be the way through which we view our reality. They can't be the way that we see our life. We see others' lives. And they can't be the way that yeah, our relationship to God is seen either. I have a really good quote from C.S. Lewis from his book, Mere Christianity, that kind of surmises what I'm saying and how we view this in light of our spirituality. But it says this, Now faith in the sense in which I am using the word is the art of holding on to things your reason has once accepted in spite of your changing moods for moods will change 
whatever view your reason takes. And so faith, having trust in God, is, is, holding, is holding on to those reasons why we believe in God in spite of what might change in our life, in spite of the feelings, in spite of the hardships, in spite of the suffering. Faith is choosing to trust in God and remembering his promises and his truth that guides our life and not our emotions that guide our own life. Our second response is remembrance is key. We need to remember God's faithfulness in our own lives, in others' lives, and in the lives of scripture in spite of how we feel. And, and what I mean by that is that just like David was remembering God's faithfulness, his presence, you know, being in the sanctuary, when we come into adversity, when we feel stressed out, when we feel anxious, a really good habit is just to take even five minutes and think about the ways that God has met you in your past. Think about the ways that, you know, for instance, like you could think about the time that God actually saved you and called you into faith. You could think about the time that God started to pull you out of your addiction. You could think about all the victories that you've had along that journey. Remembrance is really key to inspire us to trust and faith to continue on not only our journey with God, but also our recovery as well. And if you feel like, you know, in a moment you feel really down and you don't really see, you know, you can't really, your emotions are too strong and you can't see how God has worked in your own life. Call someone else. You know, I think one of the things that I'm starting to learn more and more about phone calls and making calls to a brother each week, which I'm not always great at. I'm just going to preface that. Um, but we see how God is working in another person. We see how God is faithful in another person. We see how he's moving, how he's working. Uh, and it encourage, it should encourage us. It should inspire us to new faith. It should can continue to help us along our own journey our, and our own recovery. You know, if we're having a really down day and we feel really tempted, it's always a good thing to just chat with someone else and see how God has brought them through hard points like that. See what God is doing in their own life. Um, and even God can speak to us through that. And then in the stories of scripture, like we see God's faithfulness all throughout scripture. You know, when we, when humans mess up, when the people of Israel mess up, God is still faithful, right? He made a covenant with his people and he's chosen not to abandon them. And he's chosen to keep working with them, even though they turn away and they reject him time and time again. And that's because God is faithful and he loves so well. And my third, my third response, notice that David never pitied or felt sorry for himself. His thoughts were rooted in God's faithfulness. They were not about himself. You know, if I were in the desert, say, uh, Wow, Kamloops is basically a desert. Sorry if anyone lives there, but I don't, yeah, Kamloops is kind of a desert. Not great, but um, if I were stuck in a desert and I was walking around, I don't think my first inclination would be, if I'm just being honest, to meditate on God's word, to remember his truths, his promises. I think I would feel sorry for myself, be kind of pissed off, yada, yada, yada. But notice that David, you know, all throughout the psalm, his thoughts are rooted in who God is. And in light of who God is, he knows that God is trustworthy. And because God is trustworthy, God is worthy of worship. And, and notice that his thoughts were never about himself and his own situation. Not saying it's not good to process how we maybe got to a certain point. But it was about what God will do, what God has done. And it was about God's faithfulness. And then the last kind of response point, you know, we are called to worship God, even when we don't feel like it or are facing adversity. We worship God for how he has been faithful, how he has been and will be faithful in the past, present and future. Again, we see this from this passage, right? We, we see, you know, God has been faithful in the past. We see that God is faithful in the present. You know, he's protecting David in the wilderness. And, you know, at the, at the end of the Psalm, right, he's, he's praising God because he knows he's going to destroy his enemies. 
we worship God even when we don't feel like it. We give him praise, we give him honor, we give him glory, even when our circumstances aren't great. And, um, you know, I've, I've found this challenging, you know, I've obviously found this challenging as I've, you know, you know, relapsed in the past or gone through hard times in the past. It's really hard when you're at a low point to say, you know, thank you, God, because part of you is mad. You're looking to blame someone because you don't want to blame yourself. And all these different emotions are swirling. But this passage, again, is just calling us to remember who God is, to remember his faithful love and his presence, the fact that God will sustain us and uphold us and lead us, and to worship him in light of who he is and what he can do and what he has done. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's all I feel like I really have to say today. Uh, that's what I think God put on my heart for you guys. Um, just that, you know, when you feel distant, you know, remember God's faithfulness, his love, and worship him because of who he is and what he's done. So thank you.